Soviet's calculation was that the Soviets were responsible for East Berlin, not the East Germans, and he was determined that the Soviets would recognize their responsibility there. To test East German reaction, Clay ordered armed American soldiers to escort vehicles back and forth across the border at Checkpoint Charlie. He once told me, he said, I learned early in the game of dealing with the Russians if uh, the Russians understand one thing, and that's force, that's strength. You must never negotiate or deal with the Russians without having a position of strength. To underline his point, Clay moved tanks up to the checkpoint. The Russians brought up their tanks and guns. The two sides faced each other barrel to barrel. The telephone rang in the command post. He said, let me speak to General Clay. I said, he's not here. Who is this? He said, this is the military police officer at Checkpoint Charlie. He said, holy Christ, he said, uh, the Russians have rolled in here in force. He said, they've got tanks. He said, the balloon's getting ready to go up. He said, the, the defecation is about to hit the fan. The situation was dangerous. The tanks stood facing each other. Our tank crews were told to exercise restraint to give no grounds for provocation. The dead seriousness of it became more intense with each hour. The Western forces went on alert, Strategic Air Command went on alert, NATO went on alert, uh, troops were being cranked up around the world, and one never knew if the intensity of the situation in Berlin escalated, where would be the next sore point? Khrushchev ordered the commander of Soviet troops in Germany that if the West used force, they should respond with force. I had a phone by one ear receiving information from Soviet military headquarters in Germany. The other phone was connected to the Kremlin. As soon as I got the information, I reported to the Kremlin what was happening at Friedrichstrasse. President Kennedy had uh, sent a message to Khrushchev through a new a private channel that had been established only a month earlier for a back channel uh, between uh, the White House and uh, uh, Khrushchev, uh, and uh, that President Kennedy had asked uh, Khrushchev to take the first move. The Americans sent a message. It said, in order for us to move our tanks without losing face, you should move your tanks back to a certain distance. Our tanks stood 200 meters from the Americans. The lead Soviet tank cranked up his engine and backed up uh, some five or ten meters. And we received instructions to have the American tanks to withdraw exactly the same distance. It wasn't a good enough reason to start a war. Khrushchev himself said, we're not unleashing a third world war because of Berlin. The Americans realized that too. The soldiers pulled back, but the wall remained. The East Germans built it higher and backed it with fences, tripwires and tank traps. During the first year, 50 Germans died trying to cross to the west. One of them was 18-year-old Peter Fechter. The Americans gathered, the soldiers gathered on one side, not doing anything. And 
on the other side, the GDR, the full post, the, the uh, police there were standing on their side, not doing anything. And this young man was huddled. I remember he was lying like an S-shape. And first he screamed, he cried, he shouted for help. And as the hours went on, his voice got weaker and weaker. It was so heart-rendering that in the middle of nowhere was a human being dying and two groups was facing each other, too worried to act because they didn't know what the other one was going to do. It, it was, it was, it was really horrible. He was just standing there and you thought, he's just dying and you can't do anything. I mean, I've never been in that situation before, neither after, where you actually see a person dying and you can't do anything. And I'm sure everyone else around me felt the same. The wall was the supreme symbol of the Cold War's cruelty and Europe's division. Its message was a bitter one. Whatever happened beyond that line, the West might lament, but would not interfere. The wall was a way out, really, for Khrushchev. And although the Berlin uh, affair w continued to be discussed, it was not long, no longer uh, in a state of crisis as it had been before the wall. In 1963, President Kennedy visited West Berlin. Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. When all are free, then we look and look forward to that day when this city will be joined as one and this country and this great continent of Europe in a peaceful and hopeful globe. When that day finally comes, as it will, the people of West Berlin can take sober satisfaction in the fact that they were in the front lines for almost two decades. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. <laughs> 